All right. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this week's Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. I'm Dana Bowen, one of your uh, UHG presidents. Uh, before we get started, just a few housekeeping tips. Um, please make sure your videos and mics are off during the presentation. Also, we ask that you hold your questions and comments till the end. At that point, you can uh, unmute yourselves or use the chat box. Uh, lastly, I'll put the CME information um, in our chat box periodically, and it'll also be displayed on our presenter slide. Uh, today, we have with us uh, Dr. Sarai Stancic, um, who will be giving an informative presentation on lifestyle medicine. Uh, Dr. Stancic is triple board certified in internal medicine, infectious disease, and lifestyle medicine. She graduated from here, NJMS, and after completing her fellowship, served as Chief of Infectious Diseases at Hudson Valley VA in New York for over 10 years. Dr. Stancic later served as a translational medicine leader at Roche Pharmaceuticals, where she led clinical trials in the field of viral hepatitis and HIV. She moved on from her IV career to fully dedicate her time to the field of lifestyle medicine, an interest rooted in her personal story as a person living with multiple sclerosis. She is the founder of one of the first lifestyle medicine practices in the country and mentors the lifestyle medicine interest group at Rutgers and JMS. Dr. Stancic is also a producer and screenwriter of the documentary film Code Blue about lapses in current state of medical and of the medical uh, field and the practice of lifestyle medicine to prevent, manage, and reverse chronic disease. She currently she recently joined uh, the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine based in Washington, D.C. as Director of Medical Education, where she'll focus on expanding the role of nutrition and lifestyle in medical schools and residency programs. We welcome you and thank you, Dr. Stancic, for joining us today to give this talk on lifestyle medicine. Thank you so much, Dana, for that lovely introduction. And I have to begin by thanking my friend and colleague, Dr. Deaver, for inviting me uh, to speak today on a topic that I'm deeply passionate about and I hope will resonate with all of you. I always like to bin, begin my talks, but with a personal introduction. Dana, you did a great job pronouncing my first name. I'm very impressed. <laughs> we'll start there. My name is Sarah Stancic, and I have been a physician for more than 25 years now. As Dana pointed out by training, I am an internist and infectious disease specialist, a field I became deeply interested in as a young medical student there in New Jersey. You see, I went to medical school in the late 80s, early 90s, and regrettably, that period was coincident with the height of the HIV epidemic. And as you might imagine, within that experience, I witnessed unspeakable human suffering and loss, and I wanted to be part of that solution. So when I completed my chief resident year in internal medicine, I went on to a fellowship in infectious diseases. Now, it's so important for me to state this. I am so proud of the work that I did in the field of infectious diseases over more than 15 years, not only in patient care, but also in research and helping to develop better treatments for those affected. But today, I no longer practice infectious diseases. Today, I am fully dedicated to a relatively new discipline called lifestyle medicine. Now, if we were all together, I would ask how many of you have heard of lifestyle medicine? I would guess that about a third to a half of you have heard about it. But for those who don't know what lifestyle medicine is, let me begin by defining it, by telling you what it's not. It's not alternative medicine. It's not complementary. It's not holistic, whatever that means. It's not integrative medicine or functional medicine. It is internal medicine aligned with practice guidelines, evidence-based, but with an emphasis on preventive measures, supporting patients on behavior, behavioral modification, really to educate and empower patients on the importance of optimal nutrition, a primarily plant-based diet, physical activity, stress management, effective sleep hygiene, addressing issues of substance abuse like alcohol and tobacco, the importance of social interconnectedness. We know those amongst us who are isolated or depressed are more likely to develop a chronic disease and die prematurely. Now, why is all of this so important? It's important because the scientific literature tells us that when we address and optimize these aspects of lifestyle, we can indeed prevent nearly 80% of chronic disease. We can better manage ongoing illness. And in some instances, we can even reverse the disease state. What? The logical question you may have for me is, how in the world does an infectious disease specialist with the background that I just described to you evolve into 
a passionate advocate and practitioner of lifestyle medicine. And in order for me to effectively answer that question, I need to share with you two secret experiences that occurred in my life that have shaped who I am today. One of them is a personal experience and the other a professional one. So I'd like to begin by sharing my personal story. And for that, I'm gonna take you back to October 11th, 1995. On this day, I was a third year medical resident and I was on call at Beth Israel Medical Center and it was a really, really, really busy night. One of those nights where your pager just doesn't stop ringing, I was literally running from the ICU to the emergency room and back to the general ward all night. And it wasn't until sometime in the mid morning hours where I finally had an opportunity to make it back to the on call room. I remember making my way there and feeling so deeply fatigued, something I had never experienced before. The minute my head hit that pillow, lights out. Shortly thereafter, as you might imagine, in the midst of that very busy call, I was paged yet again to address another urgent matter. But this time, when I tried to get up out of that sleeping position, an extraordinary thing happened. I couldn't feel my legs. I remember reaching down to touch them and they felt as if they were someone else's. Panic set in and next thing I knew, I was in the emergency room undergoing an MRI of my brain and spinal cord. And those studies confirmed a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis with multiple lesions in both my brain and spinal cord. And so just like that, everything changed. I was no longer that young, vibrant, healthy physician, or at least I thought I was, that had walked through the hospital doors earlier that morning. I was now an illness patient admitted to University Hospital. And with that came what I call the era of drug dependency. Um, so I, I think I've lost control of the slides, Dana. I can fix that. Um, I don't see anyone else on this post. Just a second. Sarai, are you sharing your screen? I am. Okay. Yeah. Something you, came up and said you, to approve you, you, you clicked something on the left is the annotate function. So you want to get out. It's the thing on the left here. You click. See that little, it's a little squiggle line on the left of the screen. Yeah, I did. And it's gone now. Okay. And you still can't advance. There you go. No, okay. there you go. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah, we're expert. Chief resident. <laughs> So I was admitted to University Hospital and this and it, this sort of catalyzed this era of drug dependency as the parade of pharmaceuticals marched into my life. I was immediately started on RB steroids to treat that acute event and then multiple medicines to treat, to treat my now failing bladder, peripheral neuropathy, spasticity and pain. I was discharged after five days and told to come back in a week because it was then that my doctors were, were to start me on a new medication recently approved by the FDA called beta serion. This was what was referred to as the DMT or disease modifying therapy. They told me this was the key to slowing the progression of this chronic neurologic disabling disorder. And without it, I'd likely be in a wheelchair within 10 to 20 years. I can tell you those are difficult words to hear when you just turned 28 years old. Of course, I was going to do whatever my doctors asked me to prevent that from happening. So I returned a week later. My doctor sat me down. He told me, Sarai, I want you to know that this treatment is quite effective, but it's not going to be easy. This is a drug that you're going to have to inject every day. And I said, for how long? And he said, for the rest of your life. He said, this is a drug that has a significant side effect profile that includes fever, chills, muscle aches and pains, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, anorexia, insomnia, depression, injection site reactions, and suicidal thoughts, just to name a few. But he said, don't worry, because I know exactly what to do to reduce the likelihood that you'll ever experience any of those side effects. He said, you're going to do two things. 30 minutes before you inject the drug, you're going to pre-medicate with Tylenol or ibuprofen. And secondly, and most importantly, you're going to inject the drug right before you go to bed. This way, you'll sleep with all the side effects. I can tell you that not once did I sleep through those side effects. I would inject the drug at 10 o'clock at night, and at 2 o'clock in the morning, I would awaken with violent shaking chills, fever, et cetera, et cetera. After doing this for a couple of weeks, I didn't think I could do it much longer, so I called them to let them know I was going to discontinue the drug. 
But before I could get a word in edgewise, he reminded me that wasn't an option and again raised the point of the wheelchair. He said, look, I know it's not easy, but what we'll do is we'll treat the side effects of this drug with other drugs. So when I couldn't sleep at night, I was given a prescription for Ambien. When I couldn't wake up in the morning, I was given a prescription for Provigil. And when I became depressed because my life was unraveling, I was given a prescription for Prozac. By the time I was in my early 30s, I had snowballed into this chronic illness patient dependent on nearly a dozen drugs to get through a typical day. And despite all of these medications, my disease progressed and my quality of life suffered immensely. Eight years into the diagnosis, I was largely dependent on a cane or set of crutches. And to be frank, I began to lose hope. And then at what seemed to be my darkest moment came a ray of light. And I call this my aha moment. I was sitting in my office at this point at the Hudson Valley VA in 2003 doing paperwork. And my assistant walked in to drop off the daily mail as she would every day. But on this particular day, she dropped this big stack on my desk, it caught my attention. I looked over and on top of the stack, I saw a journal and on the cover of that journal, and by the way, it wasn't the New England Journal of Medicine or JAM, it was some throwaway medical journal that I typically wouldn't uh, give a second look at. But on this day, on that cover, I saw the words multiple sclerosis and of all things, blueberries. And I thought to myself, what in the world could blueberries have to do with multiple sclerosis? So I dropped everything, I picked up the journal, I turned to the article, and of course I found an unscientific, poorly constructed study that essentially took a small group of MS patients, read, fed them a diet rich in blueberries, and the authors went on to conclude that the patients reported feeling better. Not a very objective endpoint. I couldn't believe what I was reading. I was a scientist, a researcher. How could anyone have done such a study and then had it published? I remember having lunch with a colleague of mine that afternoon who happened to be a neurologist telling him about what I had read and he laughed and so did I. But there was something about this silly little blueberry study that I couldn't get out of my head. It wasn't that I thought eating blueberries was going to solve my problems. For the first time in my adult life as a dual board certified attending physician, I considered the following question. Could there be a connection between diet and disease? Now, if anybody could answer that question, you'd think I'd be able to, right? I was a physician, four years of medical school, four years of internal medicine residency, another two as a subspecialist. That was a decade of my life dedicated to higher education in the field of medicine. But I couldn't think of any examples in which any of my professors, mentors, or educators really connected those two dots. But I remained curious, so I decided to uh, explore this question on my own. So I went to PubMed, and I typed in words like multiple sclerosis and diet, chronic disease, diet. And what I got back was nothing short of remarkable. And this was one of the first publications that I came across. In, uh, published in 1952 in the New England Journal of Medicine by this gentleman, Dr. Roy Swank. And in this publication, Dr. Swank writes about the incidence of MS in Norway, which, by the way, has one of the highest rates of MS in the world. And he notes as he drills down, he looks at the specifics of what's happening in this country. He knows the highest concentrations are occurring in the inner farming dairy community where they're consuming a lot of saturated fat. And he hypothesized back in the 1950s that somehow saturated fat consumption was playing a role in the pathogenesis of multiple sclerosis. Now, Swank didn't just leave it at hypothesis. He actually started treating MS patients with a low-fat plant-based diet in the 1950s and followed a cohort of 264 patients over 20 years, publishing his findings in the Archives of Neurology in 1970. But he didn't stop there. He followed this cohort an additional 14 years and at the end published his data in The Lancet in 1990. So what did Dr. Swank conclude after following, at this point, 144 patients over 34 years. Those who adhered to the diet showed significantly less disability and lower mortality rates. Of those that survived, 95% remained physically active. Those words, 95% remained physically active, jumped off the page for me. I mean, every time I went to see my doctor, we talked about disability. Uh, and we talked about this wheelchair and I was sort of struck by this. I'm really curious. So I continued to dig and it wasn't just Swank's work. There were Canadian studies and European studies that aligned with what he was discussing in, in these um, publications. 
And then as I continued to dig, there were other factors that were incredibly important in regards to MS outcomes like smoking and obesity and, and sun, sunlight exposure. So I started to sort of piece this idea together of all these lifestyle factors that were playing a role in MS outcomes. I was excited about everything that I had seemingly uncovered, I made copies of all of the articles. I highlighted the excerpts that I thought were relevant and important. And off I went to meet with my doctor to share what I had uncovered. I was curious as to why he had never asked me about my diet or other lifestyle factors. So I was eager to share what, what I had. He was very uh, pleasant and kind and generous and allowed me to share everything I had to say. But I, when I was done, he got up out of his chair, put his hand on my shoulder, which I've learned is never a good thing. And he said, Sarai, do you really think that changing your diet or modifying your lifestyle is going to in any meaningful way change the course of this chronic neurologic autoimmune disabling disorder? It is not. I realize this is not what you want to hear, but the best advice I could give you is remain compliant with the medications as prescribed. And if you want to blame anything for having MS, you can blame your genes because that's why you have MS and there's nothing you can do about that. So, as you might imagine, I left this visit feeling quite deflated. Whatever hope I had conjured up had been swiftly washed away, but not for long, because I started to think more and more about my doctor's parting words, it's your genes. And it brought me back to an experience I had as an undergraduate at Rutgers University when I took a genetics course. And I remember the professor one afternoon excitedly lecturing on monozygotic twins. And monozygotic twins are really very interesting from a geneticist perspective because you have, of course, two separate individuals that have the same genetic material, and we can learn a lot from that example. So I pondered the following question. If twin A has MS, what is the likelihood that twin B would have MS? So I'm referring to concordance rates. Had anyone looked at that? So again, I turned to the scientific literature looking for that answer. And of course, someone had looked at it. It wasn't close to 100% as my doctor might have suggested. It wasn't even 50%, it was 14 to 33%. So what did this tell me? This told me that it wasn't just my genes, that there were indeed other factors that were contributing to uh, this disease state. So again, uh, I turned to the scientific literature and this is when I came across the science of epigenetics. First described in the 1950s, but really sort of flourished in the 1980s. And epigenetics essentially tells us that gene expression is dependent on outside variables. That is just because you have a genetic predisposition to a particular disorder doesn't necessarily mean that it will be expressed. And so what are those variables that epigenetics speaks to that are so important in, in regards to turning those genes on or off? It's things like diet, exercise, smoking. Sounds a whole lot like lifestyle medicine, doesn't it? And I love this image because it so beautifully captures epigenetics. We have this gentleman in the center of the slide and on either side of him, two very distinct sets of decisions, right? On one side, we see an active man. He's consuming a lot of whole plant-based foods, uh, windows open. He's getting vitamin D. He's an outdoorsman. On the other side, we see the complete opposite, right? We see a couch potato, the curtains are drawn, the television is roaring, and he's consuming a lot of processed, what I call faux foods. And we can see that his decisions have led to uh, very distinct external appearances. And we could envision what the intima of his coronary arteries might look like. Of course, genes play a role, but don't let anyone convince you otherwise. Lifestyle matters most. At some point, I was convinced after reading all of this literature that I needed to implement changes in my own life. And I so desperately seeked to get the blessing and support uh, from my physician, I realized that I wasn't going to get it. So in 2003, I made the unconventional decision, sort of empowered by all that I had read, that I would focus on optimizing every aspect of my lifestyle and very responsibly taper off of the medications on which I had grown dependent. The first thing that I did was I changed my diet. I adopted a diet rich in fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts, and seeds, not because it was trending or popular at the time, but because the evidence in the scientific literature spoke to these foods as being healing and optimal for human health. I began to exercise in 2003. 
for the first time in a long time, believe it or not, in the 1990s when you were diagnosed with MS, it was falsely believed that exercise worsened the disease. I was told not to exercise. I was highly deconditioned at this point. The best I could do is to get onto a stationary bike and supported by my husband, I could do a minute or two and then exhausted and in pain, he would carry me off and it would take 10 to 15 minutes to recover. But I'd get on the day after that and the day after that, over the following weeks and months, I began to build strength and endurance, stress. I brought my team together at the VA and I let them know I wasn't going to take on that extra clinic block or that new research project. I was going to leave at a reasonable hour every day. Sleep. I was addicted to hypnotic Ambien and other benzodiazepines, which my doctors were freely prescribing to me. I had to learn how to taper and come off of those medications. I studied sleep physiology, the importance of the environment, cool, dark, and quiet, assuring that I had structure around my sleep, and I learned how to sleep on my own. And you know what happened? It didn't happen in a week, and it didn't happen in a month, but over time, I started to feel better. At first, it was something as subtle as I could stay up past jeopardy, or on one particular day, I got to the office and I felt confident enough to leave the cane in the car. I'm often asked, how long did it take before you really knew that these lifestyle changes that you had introduced into your life had really made a big difference? And it's hard to say, but there is one day that I remember well, and I happen to have a photograph of it. It's July 2nd, 2005. This is two years into my lifestyle change. And the reason I have this photograph is because I attended a wedding on this day. My friend Tim was married. And I did two things on this day that are going to sound trivial to you, but to me were a big deal because they were two things I didn't think I'd ever be able to do again. I wore heels and I danced with my husband. Around this time, my brother came to visit me. He lives in Los Angeles, so I don't get to see him very op uh, often because we live on opposite ends of the country. During this time, he was so thrilled to see his sister coming back. And he also had some good news for me. He had recently run the Los Angeles Marathon and he was showing uh, me photographs at the finish line and how felt how wonderful he felt to accomplish uh, this this goal. Towards the end of that conversation, he looked at me and he said, Sarai, I know this is going to sound crazy to you, but I think you should run a marathon. I shot him a look angrily and I said, I can't run a marathon. I have multiple sclerosis. And I always say to my brother, it's the greatest gift he ever gave me because saying those words out loud in many ways awakened me. I realized in that moment that I was living my life first and foremost as this woman with MS, this doctor with MS, this mother with MS. And with that label came so many limitations, things I could do and things I couldn't. And I realized I needed to let that go. So my brother made his way back to Los Angeles, but he had planted the seed. And without really telling anyone, I tried to do a little bit of running. It didn't go so well. I would fall. Balance was off, but scrape my knees, but heal up and try again. There's this little nature preserve right down the street from where I live. It's called the celery farm. There's a small body of water in the center of it and a path around its edge. If you make it the entire way around, it's about a mile and a tenth, so it's not very big. I remember the very first time I made it the entire way around without falling or stopping, and I felt invincible. I called my husband and I told him, someday I'm going to run that marathon. I don't know when, where, or how, but someday I'm going to do it. And I'm happy to share with you that on May 2nd, 2010, I did cross the finish line at the New Jersey Marathon. And it was an extraordinary moment for me, not because I ran a marathon, but because it proved to me in that moment that these changes that I had implemented in my life had certainly borne fruit. And today, it's been 26 years since my diagnosis, and I am medication-free and disability-free and empowered more than ever before to share this very simple but powerful healing message with whomever is willing to hear it. I thank you very much for the opportunity to share it with you. Now, I want to talk about my professional experience. Uh, I remember I said there were two primary reasons why I'm passionate about the work that I do today. And, of course, my professional experience um, just like all of you uh, who are practicing medicine day in and day out, you are managing many one many of these uh, common chronic diseases that we see on the CDC's leading causes of death. In fact, heart disease and cancer are in a non 
pandemic year. We'll talk about COVID in a little bit, but common, most commonly heart disease and cancer are the number one and two causes of death. In fact, those two alone account for nearly 50% of all deaths, but we see other lifestyle related diseases on this list as well. Chronic lower respiratory disease is obviously a consequence of smoking, stroke, Alzheimer's disease, diabetes. Diabetes uh, is a disease that is exploding in our country. When I was a medical student, rates of diabetes in the United States, about 2%. Today, we're brushing past 10%. And the CDC ominously predicts that by 2050, by the time my son is my age, 30% of Americans will be living with diabetes. I can tell you that uh, our healthcare system can't sustain that. Uh, Developing yet another drug or another target to treat diabetes is not the solution to the problem. Let me show you what diabetes looks like when you're an infectious disease specialist. This is a consult that I would receive at the VA. This is, of course, an infected diabetic foot ulcer. And the question to me would be, Dr. Stanzik, what antibiotics should this patient be placed on? And I would examine these patients. Often find bone involvement, which is, of course, what we call osteomyelitis. Very difficult infection to treat in anyone, but especially in diabetics for obvious reasons. And sometimes when we do all the right things, we place these patients on the right antibiotic and we debris these effectively. It's not uncommon for a patient like this to end up like this, right? Or even worse, an above the knee or below the knee amputation. So now we have a poorly controlled diabetic status post amputation. Are they likely to sign up for a 5 a K? No, they're gonna become more sedentary blood sugar further out of control, blood pressure further out of control, more weight gain, and that sets them up for the next catastrophic event, the heart attack or stroke. And now the infectious disease specialist is being called uh, to help manage the ventilator-associated pneumonia. This scenario that I just described to you is not unique to me. Uh, this happens every day in every hospital across our country, and no one bats an eye because it's been quite normalized. Diabetics, yes, of course, they develop heart attacks and strokes. But for me, this is largely unacceptable because this event should be rare, because we know that diabetes is largely preventable. It's not my opinion. There's ample evidence in the literature to speak to that. This is the Potsdam study uh, done by the EPIC investigators in Europe. This is a large prospective observational study looking at done by the EPIC investigators. And here they wanted to understand what type of risk reduction do we receive when you engage in healthy lifestyle behaviors? And they looked at 23,000, uh, this was done in Potsdam, Germany. That's why it's called the Potsdam study. 23,000 participants in this study. And they wanted to know what types of benefits you might reap if you engaged in these four healthy lifestyle behaviors. So what were they? Eating a healthy diet, one, in, one rich in fruits, vegetables, whole grains with low meat consumption. Not smoking, obviously smoking is the worst habit in which you can engage. Engaging in 30 minutes of physical activity a day, I mean, we could all do that, right? 30 minute walk, and then maintaining a healthy weight. Not so hard to engage in these four healthy lifestyle behaviors, but what kind of benefits might they reap? Overall, nearly 80% reduction in chronic diseases. But if you look at the uh, details under that overall umbrella, 93% of diabetes was preventable. This is the disease that I just told you is exploding in our country and that the CDC is predicting 30% of Americans will be living with uh, by 2050. We have the knowledge and understanding today to prevent that from happening. 81% of heart attacks preventable. As I said, heart disease is the number one cause of death. More than 600,000 Americans die each year of heart disease. We have, again, the knowledge and understanding to potentially prevent 480,000 of those deaths um, strokes in half, and more than a third of emergencies uh, could be prevented. We are in trouble in our country. One in every two of us is living with at least one chronic disease, and we spend $3.6 trillion uh, in healthcare, 86% of which is allotted to the management of chronic diseases. I'm going to say that one more time because it's worth worth saying again. We spend $3.6 trillion per year in healthcare in our country. 86% of those dollars are spent on the management of chronic diseases that we know how to largely prevent. Obesity rates continue to climb in our country. Uh, you're all familiar with these obesity maps produced by the CDC. This is the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System. It was started in 1985. 
1985 was an important year because the government started to recognize that the American waistline was growing in the wrong direction and they decided that they really needed to pay attention to this. And so they started uh, uh, the CDC obesity maps and every year since it's gotten worse. Just to give you a real world um, recent example of how quickly this is growing, just if you think for a minute that it's plateauing or it's getting better. In late 2019, I was offered an opportunity by a publisher to write a book. And so one of the first sections that I wrote was the obesity section. So I went to the CDC's website to see what the obesity rate was at the time. And at the time it was 39.8%. 10 months later, as we were going through the final edits on the book before it went to print, I went back to check all my facts. I went to the CDC's website and now it was 42.4%. In the span of a year, our obesity rate climbed to, to by 2.6%, which is astonishing. If you take into account both overweight and obese, more than 70% of Americans meet one of those definitions. That is, if you are normal weight in our country, you're in a minority. And more bad news from the CDC recently. If you look at this slide, those that dark maroon color, those are there's 12 states on this slide that uh, uh, illustrate that those uh, the dark maroon color are states that have an obesity rate equal to or greater than 35%. Just recently, a couple of months ago, a press release from the CDC in September of 2021 reporting that we now have gone from 12 states with um, an obesity rate equal to or greater than 35% to 16 states, and, and most notably the addition of Texas, as you see on this slide. We've known what's been fueling this chronic disease is the obesity uh, and diabetes epidemic for some time. In 1993, McGinnis and Fagy uh, published this paper, paper entitled Actual Causes of Death in the United States in JAMA. They looked at a large body of data, drilling down to see what were the external factors that were contributing to premature death in our country. And they concluded the following. The leading causes of death in 1990, no surprise here, smoking was number one, followed by our poor diet and sedentary behavior. Now, McGinnis revisited that very same question 20 years later in 2010, but this time he found that diet had now surpassed tobacco as the number one cause of death. And that's where we are today. We are literally killing ourselves with our fork. The leading cause of death today is our poor diet. This, I think, merits its own slide. Diet is the most important factor contributing to premature death. If there's any take home message I hope that you receive today, it is that one. Now, we've known for some time that diet is important. And in fact, in 1985, again, that's when the CDC started to collect data with the behavioral risk factor surveillance system. The National Academies of Science, the National Research Council realized that nutrition education in medical schools was important in light of what they were witnessing. So in 1985, they conducted a survey across the country to understand what was the status of nutrition education in, medical, in US medical schools. And this is what they concluded. Nutrition education programs in US medical schools are largely inadequate to meet the present and future demands of the medical profession. So really quite forward thinking and progressive conclusion. That was October, 1985. Here we are now, actually this is 36 years later, nutrition education still uh, largely completely missed throughout our training. In fact, uh, a survey conducted in um, internal medicine uh, interns, 94% reported that nutrition was, was important, but only 14% felt adequately trained. We're still missing this um, uh, in large part uh, in our education. And why is that? It's largely because we're still sort of working under this antiquated medical education model, which is really on, founded on, on this idea of pathogenesis. This is the foundation of our medical education model. So we really um, are trained to become really good disease detectives, right? So the art of physical exam and, and history taking, and then we, uh, and these are all uh, um, collecting clues to develop our differential diagnosis. We then um, collect blood, blood and imaging studies, again, all in an effort to create this differential diagnosis. And once we have the diagnosis, our assessment and plan, of course, includes a pharmaceutical agent, a procedure, or a surgical intervention, all of which at times can be, it can be all of those. Now, of course, everything that I just described is important and pathogenesis should be some a part of our medical education and we should be expert and thank goodness that we are. 
But the problem with that is that that's only half of the human health continuum that we're describing in medical school. The opposite of pathogenesis is what we call salutogenesis. And this is the process through which health and well being are produced. We learn nothing about that in medical school. And so, what would that look like uh, in our medical education model? It would mean curricula mo uh, modules on nutrition, exercise, sleep, mindfulness, all of these. Um, Addressing and maintaining health, self care. Self care is so important. Doctors aren't very good at taking care of themselves. Do you know that we have one of the highest rates of suicide in our profession, which is incongruent with who we are? We represent health in society. Um, developing cutting edge skills to support expertise in counseling patients on behavioral change, or at least the ability to refer patients to those who are experts in counseling on behavioral change. It's time for us to usher in this era of salutogenesis in healthcare because the path that we're on today is not sustainable. As I said, uh, these obesity rates continuing to climb and diabetes rate, diabetes rate climbing as it is, is not sustainable. We need to reimagine our healthcare system, creating a shift in paradigm and in our culture. Now, why is now the right time? Um, we've known, we've had to do something meaningful in healthcare for some time. Again, in 1985, National Academies told us it was important and imperative that nutrition and education be included in medical school. I think now there is a window and an opportunity to create meaningful change. And I say that because the entire world is fixed on one topic. And of course, I'm referring to the coronavirus pandemic. And for us here in the United States, life changed in January of 2020 when the first case was identified in Washington state and a businessman returning from Wuhan, China. And you don't need me to recount the past 24 months. There's been so much pain, suffering, so much morbidity and mortality. We've, we're close to 800,000 Americans lost and more than 5 million global souls. But how has this acute infectious contagion intersected with this backdrop of the chronic disease epidemic? And might, how might it spur uh, meaningful change in healthcare? Well, very early on in June of 2020, we, we received some striking news um, through this morbidity and mortality report by the CDC. We learned that if you had a chronic disease at the time you were infected with SARS-CoV-2, you were six times more likely to be hospitalized and 12 times more likely to die. SARS-CoV-2 has, has uh, shed on how vulnerable we are. And even in the period of vaccination, and this is a, a commentary my colleagues and I published in the American Journal uh, a couple of months ago entitled Shoring Up Vaccine Efficacy, addressing underlying uh, comorbidities is so, so important. We know, for example, patients who are vaccinated and are obese, are obese their vaccine efficacy is compromised. So it's time for us to pay attention to this chronic disease epidemic and how it's affecting us, not overall, not only overall, but also in the midst of this pandemic. I hope that this difficult period in, in our history uh, results in a call to action, that this is the silver lining that sort of tips the scale, that as a community of physicians and healthcare professionals, we realize that we need to implement meaningful change uh, to our healthcare system. I realize what I'm suggesting here will not be easy. Uh, it is quite complicated and there are many uh, uh, obstacles that we will need to overcome. But we've done difficult things in the past in the field of medicine. And I think uh, a great example where we've tackled a very difficult topic uh, successfully is of course uh, the smoking um, epidemic. And believe it or not, uh, in the 1950s, doctors actually um, were supporters of this habit. We even um, did some uh, commercials and, and promotion of cigarette smoking. But uh, as, we, as the data came in and the evidence was overwhelming, we, we pivoted and made changes. In 1964, our Surgeon General at the time, Luther Terry, produced the first Surgeon General's report that enumerated all the reasons why smoking was deleterious to our health. And so then began this public health initiative to bring awareness to Americans across uh, the United States and, and globally. Uh, it's interesting that it wasn't until 1993, it took a lot of work, but it wasn't until 1993 that smoking was removed from hospitals across the country. And that came through an um, uh, uh, initiative through the Joint Commission. But an interesting thing happened. 
Once smoking was removed from hospitals, others, others uh, fell in place. At the time, shortly thereafter, President Bill Clinton signed an executive order removing smoking from all federal buildings. And that trickled down to uh, governors and state houses and uh, municipal cities and, and towns and municipalities. And then churches um, and, and required smoking to be removed and, and schools and then restaurants and bars. And so we created a meaningful shift in, in smoking and the perception culturally of what smoking was. It was no longer attractive or cool. Uh, it was no longer acceptable. And so we've gone from a country of, in 1964, about 42% of American adult Americans were smokers. We're now down to uh, less than 14%. That's meaningful change. And so I think we're at a point right now where smoking or rather food is the new smoking uh there's something's come up on my lisa i lost the kit uh, control again oh there you go so food is our new cigarette and i think it's important for us as healthcare professionals to bring awareness and in in our in our world in in hospital settings in 2017 the american medical association produced this resolution or passed this resolution that brought attention to the importance of maintaining a healthy food environment in our hospitals. And most importantly, uh, bringing plant-based meals uh, uh, available to our menu options and eliminating processed meats. It's so interesting. There is only a handful of hospitals across the country that have actually accepted this uh, resolution. And, and, this is, and the reason is because they will not eliminate processed meats which is striking to me because in 2015, the World Health Organization placed processed meats like bacon and sausages in the same category as tobacco as a group one carcinogen. And still in hospitals across our country, we're still serving bacon and uh, sausages to patients in, in our cafeterias and in our hospital settings. So I hope that um, I've planted a seed that we could work towards creating a healthier environment at University Hospital uh, with all of your help, um, we can do that. I think it's also an opportunity for it to be a teachable moment for our patients, for our uh, employees, and for visitors. When we have, when we create a really healthy, optimal environment in a hospital, um, we can serve to cre again create that connection between diet and health outcomes. Regrettably, uh, this is a fact. 63% of U.S. medical schools are affiliated with a hospital that houses a fast food eatery. I'm so proud and happy um, about the recent um, steps that were taken at University Hospital, where there was a Burger King for more than 25 years. It was removed uh, in 2020. I actually met with um, Dr. Al Nahal this past summer to thank him for making that decision to end that contract of Burger King because it is absurd to have a fast food. Um, eatery within the four walls of a tertiary care center. He did tell me that um, it was a very difficult decision to make because it was not a popular decision, and I understand that. But sometimes we have to make unpopular decisions because it's the right thing to do. Uh, in the 1990s, when cigarettes were removed from hospitals, it was not a popular decision, but it was the right decision to do. So I want to uh, again extend my gratitude to, for, to Dr. Alma Hall for for. Um, ending the contract and uh, supporting a healthier hospital environment for University Hospital. Finally, I wanted to share um, the Lifestyle Medicine Interest Group. I was so proud of our students. This is a photograph taken in 2015. This was our inaugural class. Um, they, these these are students are all um, third year medical residents today uh, and, uh, and they're eager uh, lifestyle medicine champions across the country at their respective residency programs. And they're now um, in really uh, taking on uh, extraordinary leadership roles and sort of helping to spread this movement of empowerment and and uh, uh, and the importance of preventive medicine in, in clinical practice. So um, I, I'd also like to say that we were the third lifestyle medicine interest group in the country, and we, there are now about 72 medical schools that have a lifestyle medicine interest group, but we were number three. Finally, uh, I want to end with um, this quote that I love from Maya Angelou, and I think is appropriate for uh, today's theme. Do the best you can until you know better. Then you know better, do better. 
ladies and gentlemen, I think um, we know better today and it's time for us to do better. Thank you so much. And uh, <clears throat> thank you for um, not only this, this inspirational story of your own, um, but also for all of this so leadership and uh, education around an area that, as you have noted throughout, really has not gotten the um, attention and emphasis that uh, that it uh, really deserves. Dr. Deaver earlier uh, said to me, just wait till you hear Dr. Stancic's uh, uh, presentation, and I've got to tell you, it's worth the wait. So uh, thank you, really, for um, this wonderful presentation and um, uh, review. Um, uh, you know, lots of uh, questions. You know, I want to you know, you noted about obesity, and um, of course, uh, it, uh, we know about childhood obesity. And uh, in cities like Newark and others around the country, um, uh, it's really endemic, maybe related to food desert type issues or, or other complex societal issues. Um, uh, what about getting into the schools or other uh, ways to... Um, to address that, because we know, you know obviously, what what happens with the kids and what they start with often perpetuates uh, through life unless interventions are, are made. So, I think that yeah, that's such an important point, and those are initiatives that we we've been working on for years. And in fact, um, our medical students, they are the lifestyle medicine interest group. Um, we were, were there's a there's an elementary school across the street from the medical school where we were doing a lot of education and um, you know helping parents with recipes and speaking to you know we there's a lot of um, wonderful uh, organizations that have partnered with departments of, of health uh, like a Jersey City and there's a and if I I made a film a documentary film called Cold Blue and one of the issues that we covered was addressing you know, inner city communities and social determinants and the challenges that we face. But there are many programs that are available. And I, I don't think uh, many physicians are, physicians are aware of them. In the film, we've, we um, featured Dr. Anna Negron, who's on the outskirts of Philadelphia, and she does a diabetes clinic. So she teaches um, patients about the importance of food and the management of diabetes. And that is the prescription for fruit and veggies, and uh, the Department of Health has partnered with lo local organic farmers. So they actually pull up in front of the clinic after the clinic is completed and the teaching session is completed. They go out with their food, uh, their fruit and veggie prescriptions, and they fill them at the truck, and they're given, um, you know, whatever it is, 10 pounds of fresh fruits and vegetables. And, and she's worked on a recipe that they can utilize those ingredients, and it's wonderful. So it's really about helping uh, individuals, regardless of their zip code or, or level of education, connecting the dots between uh, uh, diet and, and disease is such an important lesson for us all to learn. Yeah, thanks so much. And uh, just want to encourage uh, people that want to put their questions or comments in the chat to please go ahead. Dr. Sutherland uh, also raised the question about the difficulty of implementing change when yeah. we have our food deserts. And, uh, Anything yeah. specifically that we can do about that? Yeah, I mean, I think we have to work um, with policy policymakers. Um, I, I met with the the mayor of Newark. Our our senator um, Cory Booker um, is is actually a vegan, and he's very aware of these connections. There's a um, we're also working again with the physicians committee. We're working toward uh, legislation. We have legislation in New York State. Uh, to create healthier environments. I mean, it's if you think about in Newark, uh, um, not only did we, we regrettably have the Burger King within the hospital, uh, um, you know, in the past, but if you look outside of the hospital, there's there's a McDonald's, there's a Checkers, there's a Dunkin' Donuts. So it's really about um, working, I think, to to change these neighborhoods and assure that we have he healthy options because um, it, it's really hard uh, to help these communities um, consume healthy, healthier options when everything around them is contrary to that. So I think we're, we're, we're having conversations with, with, um, with um, policymakers and city council in hopes that we can work together to create a, a healthier environment. But yes, the challenges are, 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 are there, but, we, but there are a lot of people who are eager to, to work on, on these challenges to assure that moving forward, we create healthier environments for our communities. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I want to, yeah, Dr. Deer, go ahead, please. 
um, uh, Sarai, I have a question for you. How do you think we're doing as a whole for medical education um, as far as lifestyle modification and nutrition? Because, you know, the like if somebody said you were giving this talk, we're like, oh, no, we're going to have some complimentary, you know, ooh, granola, uh, <laughs> you know. So how do you break that stigma that this is, you know, because you showed us the science and yeah. I think most of us believe, but it's hard to get past that barrier. Uh, no, I, I know, and that's really concerning to me because, regrettably, there's a lot of, uh, of that, you know, um, complimentary garbage out there, and um, they will, um, uh, you know, they have a big mega uh, megaphone, and um, it's profitable, and it's regrettable because, you know, Lisa. I started my lifestyle medicine practice in 2015 because I, I rather in 2012 because I really wanted to show that you can support patients in behavioral change because I was told, you know, pe people don't want to change. They just want to take their statin or they just, you know, they just want a pill. That's not true. If you if you support patients and you show them how to do it, um they want they want to live a happy a lot. I mean, the the point of all of this is and and this is my hope for each and every one of us that we all age gracefully, right? That we we don't end up in that ICU or in that nursing home um, suffering, at, you know, that bookend of life that we, we witness every day, that we can all on that last day, be it at, you know, 95 or 102, that we, we spend a spectacular day surrounded by those that we love, and then we go to bed and we pass away peacefully. That's the hope for each and every one of us. And it's possible, but you're absolutely right that, that there is, there are a group of people um, that are, are are sort of taking up this space and and using these complementary approaches and this like bucket buckets of supplements and they're making a lot of money doing it, but that's not the right approach and there's no evidence in, in the literature that supports that that improves quality of life or or reduces risk of disease. What we need to do as responsible you know ac academics and and scientists is speak to the evidence and and the evidence tells us that when we do these very simple things and this is um it doesn't cost a lot of money to do any you know people say to me oh a healthy diet is expensive it's really not i mean you can buy bulk beans and bulk rice and there's so many uh, options available to us and again these there's so many um programs uh, we, we've worked with, uh, I said, like I said previously, communities in Jersey City and Philadelphia. We have connections available to us. These programs that offer these fresh fruits and vegetables uh, to to um, inner city communities, um, free and accessible, in, in conjunction with healthcare professionals that are interested in supporting this. Um, there are a lot of uh, good people out there. Uh, I would. Uh, definitely look at the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. It's a legitimate organization and the great majority of individuals that are part of it and our board certified in lifestyle medicine are, are physicians that are interested in doing the right thing. This is not about, um, you know, mainstream medicine being uh, or, or, you know, contra mainstream medicine. Uh, medications and pharmaceutical agents are incredibly important and should be part of our um, armamentarium, but if we know that we could prevent um, uh, so much disease, we, that's where we should start. If we can prevent the disease, I mean, it's wonderful that we have all of these medications available to us, but if we could prevent a, um, a disease and we could prevent dependence on a medication, every medication, regardless of what it is, has a potential side effect. We all know that. And the more medications that we're on, the more likely that they're, you're going to have drug drug interactions. Again, quality of life is, is incredibly important. And aging gracefully is inc incredibly important. And if we do these simple things, you don't have to be a vegan. And you know, I, sometimes people get terrified when they hear certain words, and they think it's it's really about um, creating the plant as the primary um, the primary part of your plate. I mean, we we grew up with the animal being the primary part of our plate, and we know that you know plant based foods are what 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 are healing and serve us. It's fiber. Fiber feeds the microbiome, I and mean, we can go into a whole discussion about the microbiome. Um, but we know how how important the, the the makeup of the microbiome is, and the the way that we achieve an optimal microbiome is through um, diverse plant based foods. Because those are the you know these fiber rich diets are what are what uh, create healthful environments in the microbiome. Um, but you, you know I, I think that you have to be very careful because you're right. And that's why I said when I first started, this is not complementary medicine. This is not functional medicine or integrative medicine. Those are fields that I think um, 
um, are concerning to me and cloud this message. This is, uh, this is simply internal medicine with an emphasis on prevention. Uh, and, and as far as nutrition education in medical schools, it's non-existent, Lisa, in large part. It needs to be addressed. Our medical schools, um, there are on average deliver about 19 hours of nutrition education, but it's primarily under the umbrella of biochemistry and vitamin deficiencies. Like, yes, you're gonna learn how to treat scurvy because we see it all the time. Um, that was a joke, but, but um, yeah, nutrition education needs to change. And if you saw the film, Lisa, called to University of South Carolina, Greenville, uh, the reason I featured that medical school is because it is a medical school built on the foundation of lifestyle medicine. The dean there, uh, his name is Dean Yuki. He started this medical school with this idea in mind. He was a uh, he had a, he was a, a surgeon throughout his career, a vascular surgeon, and he spent many years, um, um, regrettably, um, doing amputations on diabetics. And he realized that um, so much of what he was seeing was largely preventable. And he really wanted to build new uh, medical school that was built on this foundation of what we call salutogenesis and lifestyle medicine. So that medical school is is really quite extraordinary. When you first walk in, there's an organic garden in front of the front door, and um, you can see that medical students and attending physicians, their mentors working together uh, to, to um, grow these vegetables. They start their, their day with um, a little bit of meditation in the morning. Uh, they do yoga. I mean, so their whole environment is uh, is, 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 uh, medicine is integrated into their education. If you saw the film, uh, that culinary medicine uh, scene, those kids wearing the chef hats, it's not, a, it's not a chef school, it's a medical school. And they're teaching them as they're preparing these meals. Um, they're sort of connecting the dots between, you know, here's this, um, you know, uh, the, these plant-based foods and how they serve to cholesterol, to offer satiety, to, to improve your microbiome, the evidence that, that supports that eating a diet like this serves to reduce your risk of breast cancer. You know, Mark had just mentioned the importance of getting this education. Do you know, um, in, the, in the film, Graham Kolditz at Washington University, I interviewed him because he's an expert in breast cancer. He's been studying breast cancer for 40 years. And he said, if, Sarai, if we could teach young girls at the time of menarche the importance of their diet, that they consume a primarily plant diet, that we could potentially reduce 50% of breast cancers later in life. I mean, I think that's extraordinary. And that's a lesson that could easily be shared with young girls in, in schools, and we're not doing that. So again, these are all initiatives that I'm working to hopefully uh, introduce. Thank you. Thank you for that, Dr. Stantic. <clears throat> Maybe to close out with a final question um, um, from Dr. Budnick about uh, uh, what we could possibly do to um, uh, address these lifestyle medicine issues in our preventive medicine residency program and uh, on the GME side of things. Uh, uh, any thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, I would, Dr. Budnick, I, I gave grand rounds at at, um, at their group a couple of months ago. I would love to, to meet with you and 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 show you some of, of, of the steps we could take um, to introduce these topics to your preventive me medicine residency, please feel free to email me and I'm, I'm happy to meet with you and support you on that. Uh, great, uh, thank you. Um, we also had a question, I guess we just had about another minute, we also had a question uh, from Dr. Della Piazza about uh, how uh, can we prioritize self-care um, across the dimensions of lifestyle among healthcare workers. And certainly that's it's a very current issue um, in, in our COVID era. It, it, yes, I, I think it's so important. I mean, again, it's about um, all the aspects of lifestyle, those six, t those six tiers, or I, I like to call them spokes on a lifestyle medicine wheel because it, that imagery helps you to understand how they're interconnected. Some of us are really good at our diet or some of us are really good at exercise, but then maybe we stress too much or we drink too much. And so it's important for us to um, simultaneously address all aspects of lifestyle. And again, you know, this is um, certainly what I've been working on over the more than a decade. And again, I'm happy to, if anyone is interested um, in supporting um, uh, any programs that you might be interested in implementing at, at at, at uh, New Jersey Medical School, uh, and I can certainly um, 
pass on many resources that can support. If there's an interest in doing it, and I think it's important, and again, this talk was about hopefully introducing this idea and, and hoping that it resonates with all of you. I think it's important and in order for the future of medicine to be healthy. I think we need to not only take care of our communities, but we need to take care of ourselves. Dr. Stanton, thank you again very much for really an eye-opening presentation uh, and discussion on, um, on uh, lifestyle medicine. And uh, I really uh, think it was extremely educational. I want to thank you again for, for this. I want to thank all of our participants who joined this morning um, and wish everybody a great uh, rest of the day. Thanks again so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.